our scripture reading today is from Matthew 5, verses 17 to 20. You can follow along on the screen or open up your Bibles. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter them ever. Well, good morning to everyone. It's, uh, it's good to be with you this morning and to those watching online as well. We uh, continue our series in the Sermon on the Mount, <coughs> though we're going to have a break for a few weeks next week uh, as we head up toward Easter and then we'll come back to it uh, post-Easter. And I want to ask you this morning as we begin, does obedience matter? I remember hearing once someone say that if you had understood the gospel, at least to some degree, that you've grasped that the offer of salvation is a free gift from Jesus that you would assume, naturally, that obedience doesn't matter, that you can kind of do whatever you want. After all, you're forgiven. Uh, if I was to say to you, uh, would you like a million dollars? And you would probably say, well, yes, but what do I have to do? And I might say, well, nothing, no, no, nothing at all. You can just have a million dollars. That You don't have to do anything. It's, just, it's a free gift. You, Depending on your personality, you'd either take it and run <laughs> or maybe look at me suspiciously, but take it anyway, uh, be very happy. You might even be compelled, feel compelled to be nice to me for some reason. But what I could not do is come back to you later and say, well, you must do what I say now. Because I told you at the time that it was a, it was a free gift. We didn't sign a, a bargain or anything like that. It was a free gift. Well, if eternal life, if salvation, if forgiveness is a free gift on the basis of Jesus' death, nothing is required, then why does Jesus say, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven? Why does he say that? That seems odd if forgiveness, if grace is entirely a gift from God. So that's one thing we're going to have to work through today. We're also going to have to work through what Jesus means by the law. He talks a lot here about the law and obedience and, and so on and commands. What does he mean by that? For you see, my guess is that there are many, perhaps at least a few, who broke the Old Testament law just this morning. Some of you would have got up and made yourself some delicious Sunday morning bacon and eggs for breakfast, and so you broke the Old Testament law. Others of you are sitting here, evilly, wearing clothes, clothes made of two different fabrics. Shocking. And I cannot see a single tassel on anyone's cloak. So, we're all breaking the law. The question is, why is that okay? If, that's, if Jesus says this here, and some people will come to us and they'll say to you, say to us, well, you're only keeping the ones you want to keep. You see, you, you, you go on about who you can have sex with and so on, and that you're just doing that because you're a bigot. You just want people to do what you think they should do, but when there's a law that you don't like, you just get rid of it and you sort of sweep it under the carpet and, and so on. Well, it, why, why is it that, if, given what Jesus says, that we're not keeping all of the laws that are written out for us in the Old Testament? And again, how does that relate to grace and how does, it, how does it relate to entering the kingdom of heaven? These are the things that we want to wrestle with today. 
Jesus begins this little section here uh, with a negative. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Presumably someone had accused him of that. It's not surprising. If you read through um, the New Testament, the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus doesn't always keep the law as the Pharisees and the teachers of the law thought he should. They had, uh, it might sound strange, they'd boiled down the law to 613 commands. That doesn't sound like much of a boiling down, but if you consider the whole of the Old Testament, that's significant. And they said, well, if you want to keep the law, these are the 613 things you have to do or not do. And Jesus didn't always abide by what they said. Uh, he does that with uh, the Sabbath, he heals people on the Sabbath, he lets his disciples pick grain on the Sabbath and he does it in other ways as well. There are probably also followers of his at this point in time who had been hearing from him this message of grace and they hoped, perhaps, that Jesus had come to get rid of all that Old Testament law stuff that they didn't really like. And that certainly happens today as well. People will say to you, I, I don't really have to worry about the law, I just follow the law of love. Love God, love other people, that's all I need to know. Those two commands, I don't need anything beyond that. Well, Jesus says, no, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets, I, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Uh, when Jesus said uh, the bit about not the least stroke of the pen and so on, he's probably got Hebrew in mind, this is Hebrew, uh, and you can see there's this little letter here, that's a letter, <laughs> and that's a letter, and that's the same, you can see the same letter a few times, uh, that's the smallest letter that's referred to here and the least stroke of the pen probably refers uh, to this, see this little dot here, there's a one there and there's one in, in this one too. Um, uh, that dot changes the letter that it is. So if the dot's not there, you can have, uh, then it's a different letter and the same there. Uh, it's a bit like when you, we, turn, we turn an L into a T by putting a cross, otherwise it looks like the same letter, that's what's going on here. And so Jesus is saying, well look, nothing at all, not, like not even the teeniest, tiniest little piece is going to disappear from the law. None of it. It's going to be as it is. Instead, I am here to fulfil the law and the prophets. Now, what does he mean by that? The prophet's bit, I think, is easy, isn't it? We understand that. Uh, there's an, esti an estimate I read this week, that was that Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament during his ministry uh, on earth, including especially his death and resurrection. Right? He fulfilled all the, all the things that were predicted of Jesus in the Old Testament, of this coming one who would save God's people. He, he fulfills all of that. We get that. That's, that's not so hard. But what does it mean that he fulfills the law? And how does that relate to our obedience and grace? Well, to understand that, we need to think about what Jesus means by law and what Jesus almost certainly means when he uses the word law, is the first five books of the Bible, and in particular, the laws that we find in Exodus, and Je Je Exodus Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, most of them are in Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers, and Deuteronomy actually reiterates, it's like a sermon that Moses preaches to the people as they're about to head into um, the Promised Land. And so Jesus is, has those things in mind as he says, uh, I've come to fulfill the law. In order to help us understand what he means though as he says that, it's useful, um, uh, useful to break the law down into categories. Now this is something that human beings, this, you won't find these categories kind of described in the Bible, this is something human beings have come up with, so it's not perfect but it's a helpful way to think about all of the laws, to categorise the various laws in the Old Testament to help us to understand what Jesus means here. And I'm going to dump on you a whole lot of information. I apologise, but hopefully it will actually help you in the future to understand what's happening in the Bible. So, one of the categories of law that we could think about we'll call moral laws. That is, the moral principles that are true, uh, that God gives that are true back then, that are still true now. Do not murder. 
do not commit adultery. In the Ten Commandments, you notice I have a little star there. Uh, I'll get back to what that star means. Um, you know, don't make any idols. Worship only God. Uh, tell the truth. Those laws encapsulated in, in the Ten Commandments and kind of scattered throughout the, the rest of the law, uh, those still stand. I say that because most of them are actually uh, verbatim repeated somewhere in the New Testament. They are universal. They're, they're the, uh, the way we ought to treat one another and to treat God at the core, uh, and they still hold. Jesus fulfills them in the sense that he obeys them. He, but who, he obeys them perfectly. He lives under them perfectly. He lives the good life that they describe. You see, the law uh, isn't just commands. It, it describes a way of life, and he lives that life. Now, we'll say more about how he fulfills those laws in a minute, but that, that's the moral law. They tell you how to love your neighbour and how to love God. We can read those, the Ten Commandments, and just apply them directly. Then you have another category of laws, the civil laws. So, all the laws around uh, harvesting your field and boundary markers on your field. Understand that these laws were given to a, a nation uh, and a government, I suppose you would say, uh, who were an agrarian society uh, living without a big central government. And so the laws are, are tailored to that situation. Some of the laws don't make any sense now. We don't, I mean, I, I guess you could think about moving boundary stones, but we probably don't have boundary stones, but you could apply that, of course, to moving your fence or something. But, um, but there's laws on reaping. So uh, if you were a farmer back then, you weren't to a harvest to the corners of your field, you want to leave that for the poor so that they could come and uh, pick the grain and have something to eat. Uh, there were all sorts of penalties for breaking the moral law. So if you murdered someone, you would be put to death. And there's all sorts of other penalties that are prescribed in the law of how you were to deal with people who broke the, the moral law. Now, all of that is part of the civil nation of Israel. We are not supposed to keep those because we are not a civil nation. We are a church. And indeed, from the very beginning of the church, it was a group of people within a nation and there's no command anywhere in the, in the New Testament where you're expected to kind of bring in the civil law of the Old Testament and live that out within, uh, as in try and impose that on the, on the nation that you're part of. There's lots for us to learn in the civil law so again, going to the reaping laws, uh, if, if you're a farmer or even if you're not a farmer, okay, you, you probably aren't going to leave the corners of your fields uncut because no one's going to know what that means and you'll just waste the, <laughs> waste the grain. But it might tell you that God wants us to think about how we can create work for the poor so that they don't starve. And so there are, there are good principles for us to learn in how people work and how God expects us to treat other people and all sorts of other things. They give it, the civil laws give us a sense of the seriousness of sin. I mean, you can't read past all the death penalties that are there and not, not realise that, that sin is a serious, serious business. But they're not, we're not expected to impose or keep those laws because we are no longer a nation, we're no longer an agrarian nation, we're no longer living in that particular situation. Jesus fulfills the civil law in the sense that those laws were supposed to create a, a beautiful society so that people like the Queen of Sheba would come and see this nation who were living under God's rule and say to themselves, wow, that's amazing. Now, in a sense, that's still the case with the church, only not with those particular rules, but, in the, but when we live for Christ. But also, Christ will fulfill these particular laws when he creates the ultimate society, the ultimate nation, the nation that will live forever under him as king in eternity on the new heavens and the new earth. And so he fulfills the purpose of those laws as he creates a new nation, not a civil nation in this world, but an ultimate nation in the world to come. 
The final category of laws, then, are the ceremonial laws. Sacrificial system, the laws around food, the laws to do with uh, sewing together two types of uh, cloth, uh, sewing two types of grain in your field as well, laws to do with the temple and the priesthood. Now, again, these ones, it's not hard to see how Jesus fulfills these because all of the sacrifices point to Him. All of the temple laws uh, point to the work He would do to, to make it possible for us to live with God. Uh, the festivals themselves uh, point to the work of Christ or the work Christ will still do. So, we have the Passover, uh, points to Jesus' death on the cross. We have Pentecost, the festival of Pentecost, which points to the pouring out of the Spirit, the first fruits of the church. So all of that stuff taught spiritual lessons and and we read in the New Testament that now Christ has come, uh, we don't look to those laws to learn those spiritual lessons, we look to Christ Himself. And there are some things that we we must not do anymore, we we must not offer sacrifices because that would be to to denigrate Christ's sacrifice. But we might uh, still want to keep some of the festival days, Paul tells us in Colossians and Romans, that there's no problem with that, but you can't insist that someone keep those because they pointed to Christ and, and we don't need to keep them anymore. Uh, and the reason that I had a little star next to the Sabbath, uh, next to the Ten Commandments, is because when Paul says that, he includes the Sabbath. The Sabbath seems to be in a slightly different category to all the other moral laws. Uh, the example Jesus gives when his disciples pick grain from the field is that David uh, breaks uh, one of the ceremonial laws by eating the special bread in the temple uh, because he and his men are hungry. And Jesus compares that to the Sabbath and he says, well, my disciples were hungry, they needed to pick grain. And so you can break the ceremonial laws in a pinch, that is, when there's a great need, but there's never an occasion where God says you can break one of the moral laws in a pinch because there's a great need. That's not how it works. And so Jesus fulfills the ceremonial law and we don't need to keep it anymore. Now, that's not a perfect system. You will find commands where you go, which box does this fit in? And you won't be able to work it out. But as a general rule, it helps us to understand why we do some things and not other things. We're not just picking and choosing as as we like. There are some things that Jesus has fulfilled and ended. There are some things that were related to the situation then. And there are some things which are abiding principles that we ought to obey. This also helps us to see that the law is not bad. Now, you might think, well, that's obvious. But there are many people, and maybe you're here today, and you say to yourself, yes, I like Jesus. As I said before, I like the law of love, that's great. But the Old Testament law, mm, there's some iffy stuff in there. I don't like that. But you see, you can't do that. You can't like Jesus and not like the law. Why? Because Jesus kept the law. He upheld the law. He lived by the law. And so if you say, I like Jesus, but not the law, it ought to do your head in because the way Jesus acted was guided by the law. And so Jesus demonstrates for us, he fulfills the law in the sense that he shows that it is good. He he lives as the ultimate Israelite the covenant-keeping person. And because he, was, he did that, he's able to be our sacrifice. He perfectly obeys the law on our behalf. He is the lamb without blemish. And so Jesus demonstrates to us that the law is good. doesn't mean we have to do all of it, as I've just said, but it is good. That means if we want to say, well, yes, I just love... I just want to love my neighbour as myself. If the law is good, the law tells us how we can do that. It tells us what that looks like. If we just say to ourselves, well, I just, I'm just going to love and I don't need the law to tell me, then you'll just end up loving the way the culture tells you to love. And I'm afraid our culture and other cultures don't inform us well what it means to love someone. You see, if you were to just... If you were to ask people on the street, do you love the people around you? 
most likely they will say yes. If you ask them what does that mean, depending on how much they've thought about it, they would likely tell you that it means that they let other people around them just be themselves and be free. Because that's what's loving in our culture, to let people be themselves, to be free, to not be tied down by rules and regulations, but to just pursue their dreams and their happiness and their desires. That's that's loving in our culture. The worst thing you can do in our culture is tell someone, no, you can't do that. That's bad for you. And yet that's precisely what the law does. You know, to tell someone that, they, that they're free to just go and live however they want, to live to their own view of happiness, is like telling your children, why don't you go play in the field this afternoon? Only you know that that happens to be a field full of landmines. Like that is just flat out negligence, evil. Go on, kids, go and play amongst the landmines. Well, where are they? We don't really know, just go and have fun. Now, if that was the only place to play, I probably you wouldn't want them to play it there at all, but let's just say that was the only place. The only way you could do that was if you fenced off the safe areas. And you said to the kids, look, if as long as you stay in that area, you won't step on any landmines. You'll be fine. You can, you can play to your heart's content, enjoy yourself within this boundary. And that's precisely what the law does. It shows us where the safe territory is. In fact, more than that, it shows us where the beautiful life is, the blessed life life is, the life that Jesus lived. You see, how do you think of the law? And I don't just mean the Old Testament law, though that, that included. Do you think of the law as an enemy of freedom and enjoyment, as repressive, as stopping you from being yourself, Or do you think, as Jesus thought, that the law is good? The law has something to teach us. Not only in the moral principles, but but as we see God applying the law to His people, we learn wisdom and understanding about how people work and how God works. And even in the sacrificial system, as we see the depth of our need and the wonder of our Saviour who came and fulfilled that need. You see the law as good. Now, having seen the law as good is perhaps not surprising what we read in verse 19. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commandments and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There's a warning here, friends. If you think that you can... Uh, go to the law and say, well, we don't, I mean, that's a bit old-fashioned, that's not really the way we do things anymore, let's just set that aside. And and look, there there are laws where we say, well, you know, is is this one that's enduring or is this one that's not enduring? And we can have a discussion about that, certainly around the Sabbath, there's lots of discussion, has been lots of discussion around that. But on other issues... Oh, well, we don't really think that's important. All you're doing is you're moving the fence and including landmines now into the safe area. And you're inviting people to come with you as you dance among the landmines and say, well, we don't really think God cares about this stuff anymore. And God says, well, you might still be saved, but you'll be considered least in the kingdom. Whereas, if you encourage people to look toward God's law and to find out what He wants and the life, the good life, the blessed life that He has described, then you will be considered great in the kingdom. And it's worth just asking ourselves why it is that we feel tempted to, to move aside from God's law and to go our own way. And, and of course, it's, one simple answer is because we're sinful. But, but often it's because of cultural pressure, isn't it? In different cultures and in different times, the, the, the particular law that the pressure is, is against will change. 
but often the reason that we want to change the law is because our culture says something is good that the law says is bad or the culture says something is bad that the law says is good and there's friction and there's tension and we would rather not be in the midst of that tension and so we would like to just move the fence a little bit so that we can be cool like everyone else and people have to look down on us and think it's bigoted or weird or strange or whatever. Now, we need to resist that temptation. We've seen in the last two weeks that with righteousness can come persecution and we need to be willing to take that if it means living within the boundaries that God has given us and encouraging others to do the same. Well, that leads us to those that difficult verse, verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, one of the difficulties <laughs> for us as we read a verse like that is, we th- is depending on how you think of the Pharisees, you might think, well, how in the world is anyone going to do that? I mean, I mentioned the 613 laws. They were pretty careful. They tithed their mint and their dill. I mean, they really w- tried to make sure that they did everything perfectly good. And Jesus says we have to do better than them. How is that even possible? Well, you've got to understand that though they did have their 613 commands and they seemed very careful to obey the law, they were not actually obeying the law. You see, because legalism is not about keeping the law, it's about making the law keepable. Legalism isn't about keeping the law, it's making the law keepable. That is, you reduce the law down to its bare minimum so that you, uh, so that you're able to to say, yes, you know, tick the box, yes, I do that. Now, you see Jesus teaching about this, and we'll see this as we go ahead in the coming weeks or in a few weeks' time, on, on topics like murder and adultery and oaths and, and so on. And he says, you have heard it said, do not murder, which is true, that's in the law. And I would hope, otherwise my safety is at risk, that most of you are able to put up your hand and say, well, no, I've never murdered anyone. I've never killed anyone, Jono. Well, that's good. I'm very glad for you and I'm glad for myself as well. But let's be honest. That's relatively easy to keep, isn't it? It's relatively easy to avoid murdering someone, at least in our society. But if you see what Jesus says, but I tell you, that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Now, that's not relatively easy to avoid. And what Jesus is teaching here and showing, and what the Pharisees had completely missed, is that when you read, do not murder, you were never just supposed to think, never deliberately take someone's life. What you were meant to realize was that God wanted you to protect life, to grow life, to encourage life, to help people to thrive and grow in their life, you see. And when he said, do not commit adultery, he didn't want you to just avoid, lo- avoid actual, the actual act of sleeping with someone who's not your husband or wife. He wanted you to avoid lust. He wanted you to avoid the desire to have that person who is, who is not married to you. He didn't just want you to avoid oaths and and trying to work around the oath laws, as it says uh, further on. He wants you to be utterly consistent with your word. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. You see, Jesus expands the law and he demonstrates that it's not about just narrowing it down so that the law is achievable. It's, It's about understanding the breadth and the depth and the wonder of what God intends for us as his people. And that presents us with an enormous problem, doesn't it? (laughs) Because we may not even keep the law to the level the Pharisees did. That is, the bare minimums at times. Let alone this expansive view of the law where we seek to 
understand exactly how God wants us to love and care for other people and to honour Him. And Jesus fulfills, this law, fulfills, fulfills the law in one last way that's worth mentioning, in that as He keeps the law, as He is perfectly obedient to God, He demonstrates the depth of our need. You see, one of the reasons God gave the law was not just to show people how to live, but to demonstrate that they failed to live that way. It's like standing in front of a mirror and seeing all your flaws. That's what the law does. And in, in a sense, Jesus does that even more because Jesus obeys the law perfectly. He shows that it's keepable and does so perfectly. And so we, our sin is revealed and when we start to see the depth that he wants us to understand the law and how he, it's, so, it's to so transform every area and inch of our lives, we stand humbled and unable to move forward because how can our righteousness ever surpass that of the Pharisees? It cannot. But Jesus, because he kept the law perfectly, as he dies in our place and he takes our sin upon himself, he then gives us his righteousness. And he says, here you go, I, I kept it perfectly, that's yours now. And so when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Christ on us, in us. But I don't think that's all that Jesus meant when he said, your righteousness has to surpass that of the Pharisees. He's not just saying, you need my righteousness. We certainly do, otherwise we're lost. But he actually wants us to live righteously. He wants his free gift of salvation, this, this gift of his righteousness, this, his death for us, he wants that to transform and change us. Paul says this in Titus, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great and God and Saviour, Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Grace, personified in Christ and his death and resurrection for us, grace teaches us obedience. As we read about the grace of Christ in the Bible, as we sing about the grace of Christ, as we preach about the grace of Christ, as we remind each other of the grace of Christ, as we pray the grace of Christ, and as, and as we do all of those things, the Holy Spirit takes the grace of Christ and he, he imprints it onto our heart and, and works it deeper and deeper within us so that the grace of Christ, as we see in Christ, starts to do its work in us and change us so that no longer do we say, well... If I could just avoid killing someone, then I'll be right. But we say to ourselves, Lord, help me to make the person in front of me flourish. And God says, okay, yeah, I can do that. Have you read my law? Because there I describe to you what that might look like. So that we're driven to God to say, Lord, I don't know how to act in this situation. And he says to us, well, well, look, have you read my word and the laws there and the way I interact with people? Have you seen that? And, what, and we learn more and more as time goes by to live for Christ. And we desire to live for Christ and we long to live for Christ and, we're, and we seek God's word so that we can live for Christ. Not because we're afraid of missing out, you see, but because Christ is so glorious. And as the Spirit works grace into our heart, and as we search God's Word to know how we should live, our righteousness will surpass that of the Pharisee. 
Now, if you came to Christ and you saw grace and you thought, oh, look, my ticket to heaven, and you put it in your back pocket, never to look at it again, and thinking that one day when you reach, when you stand before the pearly gates and, and you, you pull out your ticket and say, oh, look, I've got grace, that's not going to transform anyone. Because it's not there, it's not in front of you, it's, you're not soaking in it and you're not being taught by grace to live a new way of life, to desire a new way of life. And indeed, that person probably never really understood grace. If all they saw in the death of Christ was a ticket, they haven't understood what was happening on that cross. No, you see, it's not that obedience is insufficient to work us, to, to, to allow us into heaven. The grace of Christ is not insufficient. It's not as though we have to add obedience to the, to the grace of Christ so that we, we have enough in our bank account in order to get in. That, that's not the issue. Indeed, grace is so big, so incredible, so amazing that there is no sensible response, no reasonable response to seeing and understanding the depth of Christ's love for us and his death for us than to, than to fall at his feet and say, Christ, teach me to live for you. Show me how I should obey you. Show me how I can be more like you. Show me that I might honour you in my life. It's not that grace is not big enough. Grace is so big, it demands an enormous response from us. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion and to live self-control, upright and godly lives as we wait for Christ to return and gather us home. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for... Jesus Christ, our glorious and gracious Saviour, who came and lived under your law and obeyed it perfectly. In every area where we fail, he succeeded. In every area we disobey, he obeyed. In every area we minimise your law and try and work around it, he obeyed it perfectly and to the fullest extent. So that now when you look at us, you see your glorious and perfect son. But Father, we long for more. We long to actually live like him, to love like him, to honour you like him. And so we ask this morning that you would impress grace ever more into our hearts. that we would run day by day to your law, to your word, to discover the magnificence and glory of the way of life you have laid out in your law, that we might know what it means to live for Christ. Forgive us, Lord, when we fail. Encourage us when we do well. And keep us going by your spirit that we might live for Christ in every way. We pray in his name. Amen. Mm -hmm.